Good morning, people. Watch him in 65. Lisa Boyce, I'm going to give you the gospel. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Christ shed his blood for all of our sins, past, present, and future, was buried and rose again on the third day, according to scripture. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Not of ourselves, not of works, at least any man should boast. It is grace, something we didn't earn, something we don't deserve, that God gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, you and I are whosoever, the key word is believe, will not perish but have eternal life. Now, let me stop there and say this. We're at the final straw of this dispensation. We are at the dispensation, the end of this dispensation. The dispensation of grace. Which means the only requirement for salvation is is that you believe in what Christ did at the cross. You believe in his death, burial, and resurrection for all of your sins. Um, that's the only requirement. It's not going to be that way in the tribulation. Not at all. I was just talking to someone about this, uh, this a few minutes ago. It's, it's going to be... And Robert Breaker had did something about this, I think, a few years ago. It's going to be totally different in the Great Tribulation. Right now, that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. So how do you come to this? You admit you're a sinner in need of Christ. The moment you put your faith and trust in Christ, the moment you accept Christ as Savior... Not only are you saved, but you are justified by the blood of Jesus. You are rapture ready, which is going to happen at any time. And you're sealed until the day of redemption, which means you cannot and will not lose your salvation. The Holy Spirit will indwell in you. The Holy Spirit will lead you, guide you. The Holy Spirit is your best friend. The Holy Spirit will change you, minister to you, encourage you. Everything. That's what he does. And these times are getting harder. Now, Russia just put out a thing. And I think they put this out last night. They're saying that they will not shoot down Starlink satellites. My question is, why would you put that out there in the first place? So Russia has the tools needed to disable hostile satellites, but refrains from doing so to avoid escalation. And speaking of escalation... I was awakened or woke up this morning to the sound of rockets in Israel. I literally almost had to turn that thing off because it was non-stop. It was going on and on and it's just, it's quiet now, but it was really, really going on. I mean, around six o'clock this morning, it was just non-stop. But this says, in an interview with a, Mos with a Moscow-speaking radio station, uh, I guess his name is Dmitry Roginson, was asked to comment on Russia's capability to destroy Western satellites. They have the capability, but they won't do it. Including Starlink systems operated by Elon, Musk's, uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX company. He said, if we need to whack down, physically destroy, or simply neutralize the enemy's orbital constellation, we will do that very quickly. We have all the necessary means for this. However, he cautioned that any attack or other action seeking to disable satellites would be seen as a pretext for war, which will spill into space. Again, why would he bring that up? He also said that Moscow really needs a satellite system like Starlink which has thousands of relays enabling users to control drones in real time and invade electronic warfare measures. 
Since the, har- since the start of the Ukraine conflict, SpaceX has provided Kiev with thousands of Starlink terminals to help the local population to stay connected to the Internet. In February, however, as Kiev started to increasingly rely on satellites to fight Russia, SpaceX limited the Ukrainian military's ability to control drones with a senior company official explaining that this technology was never intended to be weaponized. Musk himself has said that he did not intend for his satellites to be the reason for the Ukraine conflict spiraling into World War III. So there you go. Again, it doesn't explain why you're bringing this up all of a sudden now. So, they're talking about something behind the scenes. Then this came out also. U.S. to confront Iran. U.S. is to confront Iran with naval deployments. This came out this morning. The U.S. military is preparing to boast its defense posture in the Persian Gulf, with officials claiming that the Pentagon will deploy additional assets to the region to to patrol commercial shipping lanes and protect private vessels from Iran. This is what came out today. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby announced the move on Friday. He announced it yesterday. Telling reporters the Defense Department will be making a series of moves to bolster our defensive posture in the Arabian Gulf. Using an alternative name for the Persian Gulf. U.S. officials claim that Tehran which is the capital of Iran, has attacked or harassed 15 foreign flagged vessels in the region over the last two years, calling the actions destabilizing. In the space of just one week between late April and early May, the Islamic Republic seized two oil tankers registered in Panama and the Marshall Islands, drawing condemnation from the U.S. Navy. I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of stuff is happening behind the scenes that we have no clue about. And it's worse than what it seems. Now, this is out. You have Israel. I don't know, folks. This isn't looking good. I read now. See, the U.S. is not the U.S. is not going to get involved with Iran for Israel's sake. Not for Israel's sake. The U.S. is getting involved with Iran for the sake of the traffic area in the Gulf. So, in a space of just one week between late April and early May, the Islamic Republic seized two oil tankers. Iran's unwarranted, irresponsible, and unlawful seizure and harassment of merchant vessels must stop. They're not mentioning Israel. The U.S. Command, U.S. Central Command, CENTCOM, which oversees operations in the Middle East, added that it's now working with regional allies and partners to increase the rotation of ships and aircraft patrolling in and around the Straits of Hormuz. Sandwiched between Iran, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman, 
the narrow strait cuts or acts as a transit hub for around one-fifth of the world's oil products each year. One-fifth of the world's oil products each year. While the Pentagon offered few details about what the stepped-up military presence would entail, it said U.S. warships will carry out heightened patrols around the Gulf. A CENTCOM spokesperson noted that the decision would be finalized after consulting with our allies and will be consistent with the collective desire to ensure the safety and freedom of navigation for all nations. Iran has accused the U.S. of uh, warmongering and stirring up tensions by dispatching ships and marines to the region in the past. Iranian officials said on Friday that his military has seized a tanker, had seized a tanker that had been illegally leased by a foreign national. So, once again, the U.S. is stirring up trouble just for oil. Not for Israel, for oil. That's what it said there. Basically, it's giving you... That's what it's saying in there. What times we live in. I'm going to link this in the description box. I wanted to come on because I think Barry might be doing something at noon. So I wanted to come on before he got here. Before he got on. So I'm going to link this in the description box. And I will be back later. Thank you.